Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Uh, firstly, thank you for your patience. We've just decided to delay a few minutes just with the, uh, the roadworks and the uh, public transport situation out there. So uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for just waiting there. Uh, welcome to Government House. Official proceedings will shortly commence. Uh, and now would be an opportune moment to check that your mobile phones are switched off and turned to silent, thanks. Following the official proceedings, the State Departments will be open for viewing, and when I return to lectern in a few moments, it will be to announce the arrival of Her Excellency, the Governor, uh, the official party, and this evening's panellists. Thanks.
Secretary. Would you please be upstanding for the arrival of Her Excellency, the Honourable Linda Dessau, Governor of Victoria and the official party. Please do sit down. Thank you. Could I start by acknowledging the Honourable Dame Quentin Bryce, former Governor General of Australia. It is so lovely to have you here with us in the preeminent state. It's fantastic. Uh, Patrick Hullohan, uh, the Chair of Murdoch Children's Research Institute, and uh, of course, Director Professor Catherine North, the MCRI ambassadors uh, who are with us, the panelists to whom you'll shortly be introduced, and all our distinguished guests. That's, that's everybody who's here with us this evening. Can I also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathering, the Wurundjeri and the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and to any elders who might be here with us from other communities too. I give you the warmest welcome this evening to Government House to this public lecture on global health issues for children. It's part of a series of lectures that we have been holding here over the last seven or so years that we've been lucky enough to be hosting events here in this magnificent ballroom. You know, when this building uh, was first built, uh, completed almost 150 years ago now, I'm not sure that the governor of the day would have foreseen its use in this way. That was an era when this ballroom was used for grand balls for thousands of people and the wealth of the state was such from the gold rush that the women appeared in magnificent gowns with gold dust just sprinkled throughout their hair. I'm not sure if anyone's wearing gold dust this evening, but the times change. And across the decades, its use has absolutely broadened. I mean, there's no greater example uh, than during the, the First World War when the grandeur of this room gave, gave way to trestles and packing uh, with the, the women of the, the Red Cross working so hard to support the troops. Well, nowadays, in addition to the large award uh, ceremonies and receptions that are held here to acknowledge the fantastic organisations and the fantastic people of our state, it's been our pleasure to hold a number of series here, not just the lecture series, but many performances as well. They've also been varied. We've even had uh, circus trapeze set up here in the ballroom uh, with young kids learning the circus arts. And if you're uh, the governor of Victoria, you hold your breath every time they fly near the chandeliers. I can tell you that much. Um, but this, uh, uh, this evening is a really exciting one for us. We are blessed in Victoria with a combination of world-class universities, hospitals and research institutes. And we've long been mindful of the importance of research and its relationship with clinical practice and the importance of ongoing collaboration between those big institutions, whether locally, around Australia, or in fact internationally. And I think these past difficult years of the pandemic have brought that need into even sharper focus for us and has really, they've really highlighted to us that the world's most wicked problems uh, do require collaboration uh, to ensure that we succeed, particularly when it comes to health equity. Well, there could be no more obvious place uh, to start that sort of discussion than to talk about the sorts of solutions that are needed for the health of our children. And it's prompted us to pose the question this evening that our brilliant experts are going to answer. How do we make the healthiest generation ever for every child? When I said that we're blessed in Victoria by the caliber of research institutes uh, that we have, I can say hand on heart that we have every reason to be proud in that context of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. It's the largest such um, institute in the country and rated as one of the world's leaders in its field. More than 1,200 researchers working with partners within the Children's Hospital and experts from the University of Melbourne, addressing really some of the most complex issues of our time. 
And if we're blessed to have those institutes uh, in Victoria and we're blessed to have the MCRI in particular, then we are triply blessed to have Professor Catherine North as the director. Um, Professor North will be introduced shortly. She's a paediatric physician, neurologist and clinical geneticist, and truly a national and international leader in genomic medicine. And shortly she'll fa facilitate a really wonderful panel of experts whom she'll introduce to us. But before that happens, I do want to introduce a very special guest to say a few words. Our 25th Governor General, the Honourable Dame Quentin Bryce, I think is probably known to everyone in this room. If not personally, I think they would feel as though they know Dame Quentin after the many years of devoted service that she gave to our community and continues to give to our community. Dame Quentin's wide-ranging contribution to public life is not only admired, I think it's genuinely loved as well. And what's significant is that when her contribution through f uh, the formal role of uh, head of state was completed, her contribution to the community wasn't completed at all. And uh, I hope it never will be because what she does for our community is so outstanding. I know the MCRI is one of the beneficiaries of Dame Quentin's continuing commitment and wisdom. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce her to say a few words this evening. Thank you. Good evening, uh, my friends. Your Excellency, thank you for your warm welcome and your uh, kind introduction. Distinguished guests all, I pay my respect to the traditional keepers and uh, I always like to acknowledge the debt of gratitude that I owe to wise Indigenous women who've taught me across my life what it means to be an elder, sharing language, country and culture. My friends, how lovely it is for us to be here this evening on this gorgeous summer's evening in this uh, magnificent room. It doesn't seem the, quite the right word room, does it? It's uh, so grand and so, uh, so beautiful. I wish it was a ball though. Uh, we're here for the uh, 2022 Government House Public Lecture Series. I always have to check whether I need my glasses or not. <laughs> the uh, uh, beautiful home and the glorious gardens that bring such pleasure to the people of your city and the thousands of thousands of your visitors who come here. I can't uh, believe, and it happens every time I come here, the roses and that glorious magnolia on the uh, front lawn with the blossoms this big. I have two at home that I'm very proud of in pots and they're looking <laughs> a little bit pathetic in my mind. All Australians are sensitive to the tough times that Victoria's endured with fortitude uh, during the pandemic years. And I think your deep understanding and appreciation of the power and meaning of togetherness and collegiality will endure to stand you, uh, your generous hearted community in great stead, a source of courage, support and inspiration for the years to come. Allow me, Your Excellency, uh, to express our gratitude uh, for your service, selflessness and accomplishment across your term as Governor. Your leadership that shines on every occasion from grand platforms to quiet corners. Your capacity for friendship and hospitality that Michael and I uh, and so many others of course have greatly enjoyed uh, on memorable occasions in this historic uh, house, but uh, one that's characterised by a contemporary uh, hospitality and atmosphere. I'm most complimented by your kind invitation to join this gathering as a member of the Murdoch Children's Council of Ambassadors. 
We value enormously the opportunities we have to observe firsthand the impact medical research can have on a child's future. Indeed, it's a privilege, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by some of my uh, uh, companions from uh, the ambassadors group. We come together uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, to hear from leading experts in child health research, policy making, and strategic future building to explore, as uh, Her Excellency has said, how do we make this the healthiest generation ever for every child? For many of us, it's easy to look the other way or forget when our little ones are well or receiving world-class health care. However, there are some serious health challenges facing children in Australia now and into the future which we must address, including the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is why we are all here today to understand what we can do to support them. Yes, our children are our future. Yes, we do care very deeply for them. And to better our futures, we must invest in theirs. There is, I believe, no research institute more capable of addressing oncoming health issues for our children than this internationally leading institute, the Murdoch, as we call it. It has over 1,500 researchers across clinical sciences, genetics, infection and immunity, population health and stem cell biology. Based here in Melbourne, located in the greatly loved Royal Children's Hospital, neighbours to the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, six world-class institutes, three hospitals, the University of Melbourne, what an outstanding, respected and admired uh, health precinct. For more than 35 years, the Murdoch has been tackling some of the biggest health issues faced by our children. But the work at the Murdoch goes beyond research. It helps to shape state, federal, international government health policies, to develop clinical guidelines for diagnosing and treating children, to inform best health care practice. I've never been able to resist being an advocate for children. I think it's something that happened to me instantly when I became a mother. And these days, I follow Maggie Smith's instruction in Downton Abbey. The role of a grandmother is to interfere. <laughs> the Murdoch's commitment to children's health is truly inspiring and I take enormous pride in everything they do. A snapshot, if I may, of some groundbreaking discoveries. A multi-year study of mental health in primary schools to embed child mental health and wellbeing coordinators in every school in Victoria. This exciting project will ensure a whole school approach is implemented for students, staff and families. The Institute has just ticked over their first year of recruiting Victorian babies and their families into a mega study, Gen B. These families will be part of Australia's largest ever child and parent study population. It will give our researchers incredibly rich data to unlock the most complex diseases affecting children today. Globally, the Institute has launched a mass drug administration study for scabies in Fiji. The bacterial complications of the condition especially affect the health and well-being of children. Scabies causes a debilitating itch and sleep deprivation for little ones and can result in stigma, missed school and an increased need for health care. I must mention the fantastic adventure the ambassadors, all of us grandmas, had visiting rural programs in Fiji. Seeing for ourselves the hands-on MCRI's contribution to improving in that wonderful neighbourhood country, children's enjoyment of life, their energy levels, their opportunities. Recently, the Institute launched a series of family books 
called Sleep with Kip, designed to guide children aged three to eight, and importantly their parents too, on how to fall asleep, stay asleep, and if needed, go back to sleep based on 20 years of clinically validated evidence-based research. Murdoch is led by the truly remarkable Professor Catherine North, a clinician scientist trained in several specialties. Catherine is also the David Danks Professor of Child Health Research at the University of Melbourne. Recognised as a national and global leader in genomic medicine, Catherine chairs Genomics Australia, a new health agency established to support and accelerate genomic technologies into clinical practice. Her career is one of brilliant achievements, glittering prizes, intellectual rigour and long hard hours by the midnight oil. Catherine guided, guided the Institute through the global pandemic with skill, fine leadership, utter devotion. Her capacity to communicate the most complex medical science and research, to engage, to fascinate, to inspire, and in particular, non-scientists like me who love uh, science, her capacity for that communication that's so vital for our community is absolutely stunning, enriching and empowering. My friends, I welcome uh, to address us Professor Catherine North. Thank you, Dame Quinn. We will now begin this evening's Q&A panel discussion. I invite forward the panellists, Dr. Daniel MacArthur, Professor Sharon Goldfeld, and Liana Buchanan. I also invite forward Professor Catherine North, Director of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, who will now moderate this evening's discussion. Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you, Quinton, for that very warm introduction. Um, I'd really like you to introduce me uh, at almost every talk that I give. That was <laughs> incredibly touching and I feel um, very humble and touched. Um, and thank you to Her Excellency, the Honourable and Wonderful Linda DeSoro, Governor of Victoria, uh, for having us in your beautiful home and the whole team here who are spectacular, um, incredibly organised and it just feels wonderful and um, you make us feel important, which is, which is really lovely. Um, it's great to be here with all of you, seeing people face to face after the last couple of years. Uh, just it, it continues to delight me seeing people in three dimensions. And it's great um, to have these wonderful experts who I'll introduce in a moment uh, to have a discussion about what the future holds for the health of our children and what's keeping us awake at night. But most importantly, what we're going to do about it. At MCRI, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, we believe that every child, every child deserves the opportunity to live a healthy and fulfilled life. And that really builds on the vision uh, that Dame Elizabeth Murdoch had when she and David Danks uh, initiated and established the Institute um, back in 1986. It was initially established to focus on the sickest children that were in the hospital, who are our, our partners um, in, in caring for children and in translating our research into practice. Dame Elizabeth was very troubled by the one in 12 children who have a rare genetic disorder, uh, which is the major cause of chronic disability and the major cause of death under one year of age uh, in our children. Genetic disorders are, um, they're at the hospital at any one time, one in three kids is there because they have an inherited or genetic disorder. Uh, and so it was that concern and what can we do about it that really led to the establishment of our wonderful institute. And since that time, we've expanded to focus on the range of issues 
that face our children um, in partnership with the Royal Children's Hospital, uh, but also reaching out into the community. And we have footprints in over 40 countries around the world. Now today in Australia, you know, despite even the pandemic, our Victorian children are ranked amongst the healthiest in the world, which is wonderful. Our paediatric healthcare system, our healthcare system, our research um, is, is really world leading. And we want, but we have a problem. Um, we've been through the pandemic and I'm not gonna really focus in on that today, uh, but these are problems that we've been seeing occurring in kids, uh, a silent epidemic. Uh, that we makes us worry about the future of our children and their long-term health. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, which is being called uh, a crisis happening in slow motion. Uh, we have disorders that are becoming increasingly common. Uh, one in 10 of our kids has allergies, and Melbourne is known as the, food, as the allergy capital of the world. One in five of our children have mental health issues um, by the time they hit adolescence. And many of these have their origins in the under 10 year olds. And you've heard about the program that we're doing to really bring mental health uh, professionals in for early intervention and prevention within our primary schools. One in four of our children is a, a overweight or obese, uh, which leads to and is the precursor to serious adult problems such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease risk. But what is worse is when we bring inequity and disadvantage into this equation um, because a disproportional, disproportionate health burdens fall upon our most disadvantaged children and families. The statistic that scares me the most is that one in five children that are growing up in socially disadvantaged or toxic environments are intellectually impaired by the time they get to school and they don't catch up. That, that's frightening. The most disadvantaged parents experience substantially poorer quality of life, poorer diet, more mental health systems, poorer language and hearing ability. They have higher blood pressure, higher fat levels, more arterial thickening and their lung capacity is lower just from that environmental effect of chronic disadvantage. And what we're seeing as we follow kids through the life course is that by 11 to 12 years of age, in those situations, these kids that are consistently disadvantaged are demonstrating the precursors to these same parameters. We're seeing the precursors of cardiovascular disease and the social, um, intellectual and mental health problems. So these statistics are simply unacceptable to us. Um, which is why today we're discussing how can we work together to make this the healthiest generation ever for every child. Now to explore this further, I'm going to introduce you to our three leading experts in child health research, policy making and strategic future building. First, um, uh, Professor Sharon Goldfeld. Sharon, wave. Sharon's a paediatrician, a public health physician. Um, she's the theme director, or leads the division of, of population health at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And she's also, uh, in her spare time, the director of the Centre for Community Child Health at the Royal Children's Hospital. Sharon has a decade of experience in state government as a senior policymaker in health and education, which we think go hand in hand, um, including a role as principal medical advisor for the Victorian Department of Education and Training. She has an outstanding career which has seamlessly straddled research, policy and practice. And really how we can take research at a population scale with a focus on prevention. During COVID-19, Sharon was a tireless advocate um, for, for our children, um, really working closely with government to convince them to get our kids back to school, uh, but also turning her lens onto the experience that children and families were having. Uh, and what that means for future consequences. And Sharon will highlight today the importance of medical research to meet the upcoming health challenges of children. Next we have Professor Daniel MacArthur. Daniel's the director of the Centre for Population Genomics, which is a collaborative effort um, between the Murdoch Children's and the Garvin Institute for Medical Research in Sydney. We've recently established this because genomics and genetic predisposition um, is really critical to understand as well as we look at the environment um, to solve many of the problems um, that are facing our children and our society. 
and Daniel is focused on executing large-scale projects um, that will give, uh, and we're already giving Australia leadership in this field, as well as bringing a lens of equity and diversity um, to how we look after our populations. Daniel came to us from Harvard um, and the Broad Institute of MIT, where he's co-director of the Medical and Population Genomics Program. And he has led um, the establishment of the world's most used Australian uh, genomic reference database, which has really transformed um, research and clinical understanding. And last but certainly not least, we have Leanna Buchanan, Wave. who's the Principal Commissioner for Children and Young People in Victoria, uh, which is a statutory organisation providing independent advice to government. She also sits as part-time commissioner to the Victorian Law Reform Commission. Liana has um, held, also held legal and policy positions with a social justice focus over a number of agencies, the Equal Opportunity Commission, the Department of Justice uh, and Women's Legal Services. Over her uh, tenure over the past six years, Liana has implemented multiple policies and practice to improve the safety and well-being of the children of Victoria. And she's seen firsthand the impact of COVID on our children. She's really going to share her great experience in how Australian families are dealing with our current health challenges um, and the long-term uh, challenges that we're facing. So welcome to all of you. I'll come down and join you. What we're going to start off with, and I want to hear from each of you, is what you consider to be the leading health challenges children are facing today in Australia and around the world from your perspective, and how might we, how might we change that in the future? A small question. Sharon, I'll get you to start off. Um, thank you so much. We were just um, um, talking previously, there's the threat that four of us and microphones, we wondered if we should do a song and dance thing, because it is an evening function, but we won't. Um, so I think it's a really important question, you've touched on some of it. So I think um, a century ago, infectious diseases was really the prime problems that we had with children. And then I want to tell you a, a kind of a good story, and the good story is the vaccine story. And, and the reason why it's a good story will be a segue to some of the things we talk about later. And that is the story of inequalities in this country. So I could name you almost any outcome and we have inequalities for them. But the particular one we should worry about is the developmental inequalities we have for children. So by the time children start school, there are three times the difference of developmental inequalities between children who live in the poorest areas and richest areas. And that's right now, that's not data from five years ago, that is 2021 data, and it won't surprise you it got worse over COVID. And so those are sort of challenges, those sort of wicked challenges um, that we have in this country and it requires some really complex solutions. So if you ask me what the greatest problems we have is those developmental challenges because what's really concerning is by the time kids get through school, those inequalities have only got worse and that's 13 years of five days a week, seven hours a day, 40 weeks a year. And so... I really think that's one of our greatest challenges going forward. Thank you. And over to you, Liana. I know that some of your thoughts will be related to Sharon. Yeah, look, that's, that's right. Um, well, as you described, I'm not a medico, nor am I a scientist. So I go straight to some of the social drivers of poor health for children. Um, as Sharon has just described, inequality and poverty has to be named. I think we have to name climate change and certainly if you ask children, that is their overwhelming number one concern. We had another study released today that demonstrated that and the connection between that concern for children and their mental health. But the third um, uh, challenge uh, that I will name relates to trauma for children. Uh, and in particular, trauma that comes from violence, abuse and neglect. And I name that uh, partly because I think it is hidden and less acknowledged than many of the health challenges that children face. Um, uh, I could uh, regale you with data and I won't do it, but suffice to say that in my six and a half years as Commissioner for Children, 
I've tabled in Parliament eight big systemic inquiries detailing challenges in our child protection and out-of-home care systems. I've led over 250 inquiries into the experiences of children who've died after child protection involvement. I've overseen investigations into over 11,000 allegations of harmful conduct towards children in organisations like schools and churches. We have to acknowledge that harmful conduct, harms to children, is a critical public health issue. And uh, as I might talk about a bit more later, our, our service systems between health but other systems that we like to think uh, are going to um, uh, protect children or intervene to support them and their families and then help those children recover that, that they're not fit for purpose. They're not absolutely not meeting the needs. So uh, we know, of course, that trauma in childhood, that adverse childhood experiences not only represent harms to children now, but they have serious implications for physical and mental health and indeed social and economic outcomes for children. So that has to be part of our grappling with how to make sure that children's health uh, is equitable and improved across the board. So what we're hearing, I think, is that inextricable link between um, environment and social advantage and the social um, setting that kids are, are growing up with uh, and how we need to think, not just within our medical lens, but in our social context of what we can do. Um, so that's from the social environmental perspective. And Daniel, your focus um, has been very much on the genetic susceptibility and the genetic makeup. So um, your thoughts from the challenge perspective. I mean, well, firstly, I agree completely with everything that Sharon and Leanna have, have said. And I think the, that theme of inequity is one that we'll return to multiple times this evening. Um, but as you said, the, the, the problem that consumes me the most is, is the one that you highlighted in your opening remarks around the impact of, of individually rare genetic disorders, things like muscular dystrophy, that al although they are each individually rare as diseases in, in concert, uh, collectively are actually really common, and as you highlighted, have this tremendous overall burden of suffering that falls disproportionately on children. The, in, in addition to these being common, one, one of the things worth highlighting here is just how few effective treatments exist for so many of these conditions. Less, right now, less than 5% of all paediatric genetic disorders have any kind of effective therapy available. So that, I think, represents a tremendous opportunity. Uh, the sh and we'll come back to this, I think, later. The shift in the availability of technology that's now driving more and more therapies targeted to, uh, to deal with these individual disorders will have a, have a major impact. We have to think about how do we deploy those technologies in a way that is equitable um, and helps as many children as possible. So, Sharon, a question for you, um, and I, I know you bring the, the lens of equity to everything. Um, Victoria and indeed Australia, by international comparison, we've got a strong healthcare system. Um, but how have we as researchers and in terms of the healthcare system responded to COVID, um, particularly for our children and in Victoria? And what can be done to meet current and emerging health challenges? Another small question. Yeah. I want to bring up this um, term radical pragmatism. It's a really cool term, and I'll tell you why. It, it actually was what we did during COVID. And the idea of radical pragmatism is really taking what we already have and looking at how you can turn it into some, something really useful, but testing it along the way. And that is exactly what we did during COVID. We didn't have a vaccine, then we had one in 12 months. We repurposed the way we think about our healthcare system. We made it more available to those people who really needed it, and, and that wasn't children. What we probably didn't do, and what we probably still need to think through is, what are we gonna do for kids now? And, I, and we'll talk about the details of that later. But, but actually, children kind of fell off um, the healthcare bandwagon, I guess, um, during COVID. And I think our challenge now is how do we do this idea of radical pragmatism? And the other word I want to bring in is this idea of stacking. So number one, how do we be radically pragmatic about what we already have and use this exactly, this world-class healthcare system? I mean, we have an extraordinary 
maternal and child health system here in Victoria, in my view, one of the best in the world. But it's not particularly equitable. So how do we do that? How do we utilise these systems? And then how do we, and that's the radical pragmatic bit of it, and then how do we start stacking? How do we make sure we have great antenatal care followed by great maternal child health, followed by great early childhood education and care, followed by great schools, early identification, meet the needs of families? That stacking, that kind of sitting in complexity, that's the opportunity we have because we have this world-class service system. We just kind of need to tweak it and test it. And I agree. I think we need to be bringing that radical pragmatism to so much of what we do. Uh, we were very successful in dealing with COVID as an infectious disease, but why can't we bring that lens to so many other problems that we're dealing with? I'm actually going to go to you first, um, then, Liana, because I think this, this relates to what Sharon was saying, is that you know, globally this disproportionate health burden falls on the most disadvantaged children and families. Um, so I'd love your perspective of what challenges these families are deal with and, and what, what are we doing and what can we do uh, to help tackle what is you know, a vast problem, but it's, it's our responsibility, I think, to step up. Yes, and I think, uh, uh, and I'm not saying anything new, but I think what we saw with the pandemic was that inequality widened. The gap for children and young people in particular widened enormously. And some of, uh, I think what Sharon at least is uh, kind of suggesting is that we're going to need to work very, very hard to um, narrow that gap. Uh, again, there are a lot of children and young people whose experiences um, are, are still severely affected. More broadly, uh, not just looking at COVID, I mean, when I think of some of the challenges that the children I come into contact with or whose experiences I look at, when I look at them and their families, really I see a pattern of complex and often compounding experiences of dif disadvantage, poverty, uh, mental ill health, substance use, family violence, um, very significant issues often cycling from one generation to another. Then when I look at the service systems and the responses to the needs of those children and families, I see service systems that are stretched, that aren't funded enough to do what they need to do, and that tend to have a focus on crisis, uh, that don't have the capacity and probably aren't designed to intervene early. So in my work, for example, I often see again and again, unfortunately, children who are the subject of multiple reports to child protection and they're caught in a revolving door of child protection closes the case, refers the family to some other services, health and other. Uh, the services don't manage to engage with the family or their waiting lists are closed. Nothing changes for the child. There's another report and another report and another report and the intervention, whatever it is, comes very late after a lot of further harm has been done. So there's something for us about uh, moving just as we understand we have to in a health sense, but across all of these issues that impact our children, we have to kind of grapple with what early intervention means. The other thing that I would say in terms of challenges that these families face is service systems that work in silos. And for these families, that means they have to navigate sometimes an incredibly complex and opaque set of systems when their needs, their needs for health services and for social services are absolutely intersecting. So there's opportunities for us to build on good examples of integration that we have in this state, a very healthy universal platform, both in health and in education and in early childhood education. We've got some great building blocks in Victoria, but there's more to be done in terms of early intervention for families and in terms of service integration so that services wrap around the child much more. So this is a great lead into a next question for you, Sharon, um, is you know, how can we, how can medical research seek to overcome the challenges? We're, you know, really talking about whole of system change and really uh, taking a different approach, looking at prevention and early intervention. So how are we going to do it, Sharon? Here's one I prepared earlier. Now, um, so 
I want to just bring up this idea that when we're talking about kids, we're kind of talking about sell to society solutions. We're not talking, there's no silver bullets. I would love to tell you, hey, I, here's one I prepared earlier. It's one intervention that's going to solve everything. Kind of those days are gone. They probably ended with immunisation. And so now we're sitting in kind of complexity and that means we have to test in complex ways. And it turns out in Victoria, we probably have the single most exciting platform to do that, and that's Gen V. And that is a cell to society cohort, and it's the babies and their parents. So now we're not talking about little tiny cohorts, little tiny projects. We're recruiting babies across the whole state with their parents, and we're gathering everything from their saliva, their poo, their blood, we're going to understand everything about the building blocks of their genetics right through to understanding the environmental conditions, this is the climate change stuff, the environmental conditions they're growing up in. And the other U-Butte thing is not only are we just going to follow these families and see what happens, we're going to set this up as a testing platform. So for once, we're going to go beyond the silver bullet and look at all the things we might be able to do for families at once test different system changes, test different interventions we're delivering for families, test different medications, different clinical aspects, all at once. Because I think that's the sort of grand plan we need to change inequity. We haven't changed inequity, like NAPLAN results haven't changed for three decades. So you know the definition of insanity is you keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome. So I think that's what medical research is going to do, is going to actually make us more sane. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Daniel, I know that um, you're very involved and excited with Gen V, but it's really then taking us back to how we bring um, genetic risk and genetic predisposition into this partnership with how we're looking at environment and society from the children's health perspective. So can you give us a, a bit of an insight into what research in, underpins what we're doing um, in genomic medicine and how we can adapt that for the future? Because I, I really think so if we bring all of this together, it's incredibly powerful. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's right. And obviously each, each of these components is only one piece of a, of a much larger picture. So, so genomic medicine is a, a, a branch of medicine where we apply what we would call genomic technologies, a set of technologies that allow us to look and measure each of the 20,000 genes in the human genome at, at the same time and apply that to the practice of healthcare. Uh, this is, genomic medicine is already a, a space that's having a, a huge impact, as, as Catherine and others have emphasized, in transforming the diagnosis of rare genetic disorders, um, it's also already had a massive impact in the treatment of cancer, where it's now routine for uh, individual cancers from patients to read out uh, the entire sequence of the genome of those cancers and use that to select the treatment that will have the, the best impact for that particular patient. Uh, in, in the future, this will start to, to trend in directions where we can start to apply information from across the genome to predict the risk of common complex disorders like, like heart disease as well. Uh, to, to get this right, to ensure that we can have the impact that we want to improve both the, the prediction of future disease risk, the diagnosis of disease that already exists, and uh, developing new, new therapies for disease and making sure they're tailored to the right patient, we need firstly to make sure we're investing heavily in that, that underlying uh, research space, but also building a strong biotechnology sector here in Australia. And I think that's, those are two areas where clearly Victoria is playing a massive role with this, with this incredible set of precincts, with research institutions, but also with large-scale investments in, in building out technologies like the mRNA platforms that have led to such effective COVID therapies and are already also uh, one of the most promising set of platforms around the diagnosis of disease. So that, that's, that's critical, but I, but I did also want to return to that theme of equity. If we want genomic medicine to benefit all Australians, this is going to require a, a significant investment in thinking about how do we build the resources and how do we shape these technologies in a way that everyone, regardless of their ancestral background, can actually benefit from that? And that will require real thought in, um, in basically just making sure that these technologies are not only powerful and accessible, but that we're, we're really building them to benefit everyone across the country. Perhaps you could just build upon what you're doing from the reference genome database perspective, which is really, I think, bringing equity into what is 
the cutting edge technology that we're going to need to use to really look at risk factors for things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, to name a few. Right, so I mean, when, when we talk about genomic medicine, this, this has to involve not just looking at the genome of an individual patient, but thinking about how we can then compare that with the genomes of hundreds of thousands of other people, ideally people from the same community, so that we can understand which of those genetic changes that we identify in that patient are rare in the community and therefore might underlie severe disease, and which ones are more common, and which ones are actually associated with, with particular disorders. So that requires a real deep understanding of the genetic background of every community in Australia. The challenge right now is that existing international databases of variation, like the one that I led the development of while I was based in Boston, uh, don't include many of the communities that live here in Australia. Right, right now, there are at least three and a half million Australians who come from communities, from our indigenous communities, uh, from the Pacific region, from Southeast Asia, from the Middle East, and from East Africa, uh, who are effectively entirely missing in these global databases of variation. And so unless we can build more representative resources that actually do reflect these communities and represent them properly, uh, these groups will not have access to the, the same uh, impact of genomic medicine as we find elsewhere. In fact, I, I mean, I think here is a real risk. These technologies are extremely powerful. They will transform the diagnosis prediction of disease. But unless we can get that equity, equity angle right, we could end up in a situation where they simply exacerbate discrepancies in, in health outcomes. Thank you. Now, Liana, to you, um, as, as we sort of move into a couple of final questions, uh, from your perspective, what are the opportunities where we can integrate research and policy development and work closely with, with you and with government to improve children's health and safety? Uh, I mean, I think, uh, I think it's self-evident, uh, or it should be, that the opportunities are enormous. Uh, of course, uh, researchers should be influenced by, informed by, uh, what are the most acute uh, issues that policymakers are grappling with. And of course, policymakers should be uh, making decisions <coughs> informed by <coughs> the very best <coughs> and most recent available evidence and research. It's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. So what do I see? I see some great examples of that happening, but often what I see is the streams are operating, uh, both looking at uh, similar issues or areas, but in parallel, not in a connected way. So I think there's enormous potential for us to kind of bring together more collaboration, more integration. <clears throat> I could give lots of examples, and the example I'm going to give is very simple, and it's not particularly an example of integration between research uh, and decision making, but it was a very compelling example for me. And it was during the pandemic, uh, watching the work that the Murdoch Children's Research Institute did, beginning, or at least I first noticed it, in the latter half of 2020. And it was the work that the Institute did to really uh, start focusing on children, transmission amongst children, transmission in school settings, and it was really the beginning of work that I then saw the Institute did in a fairly persistent and continued way to highlight the impact not only of COVID uh, as, a, as a virus, but COVID in terms of all of the restrictions uh, and all of the changes that we were making to try and manage COVID and a really highlight and get government and us as a community th to think about children. Now, the reason that I bring that up is because I saw from kind of September 2020 onwards uh, that that research and the fact that the Institute engaged with government and departments kind of wanted some of this research, at least in the beginning, that had traction with government in a way that I, sitting on the side trying to advocate for more account to be taking of children, just wasn't able to get. So that to me is an illustration, the kind of importance of health research, the importance of good evidence, uh, highlighting the issues for children, the impacts on children, and that ability then to influence government to make sure that we don't leave children behind. Uh, it was a very good example. My view might be it still took a little bit long, uh, but it absolutely had impact. And Sharon, the last question to you, 
Um, as we've heard, Victoria hosts some of the world's leading research institutions, including our own. How, how are we all working together to solve critical health and equity issues? I, I want to um, use a couple of examples of success in this country and how working together makes a difference. There are two I want to give you. Um, they're both related to um, our ability to create equal outcomes for children. One is our immunisation rates. And our immunisation rates in this country are the same, if not better, for our First Nations children across the country. So that's example number one. And why? Because um, researchers, all sorts of researchers, biomedical researchers, infectious diseases researchers, technical researchers at places like CSL, all got together to work out how do we, number one, create vaccine, number two, how do we create vaccine that we can de develop at scale, and then number three, researchers then worked with government to get data, how do we know who's not getting immunised, and then the next bit was how do we make sure all across the country we can repurpose a whole lot of workforces to deliver vaccine to whoever needs to get it. That sort of thinking, that sort of medical research across all the different types. If you think about Parkville, almost every single part of Parkville would have needed to be involved with that. Meant that one outcome in Australia is equal. The second outcome is just as important and again involves all of those institutes and that is our five year survival for leukaemia for children. Again, it is the only other outcome we have in this country where there are no inequalities. Why? because medical researchers got together with clinical researchers to make sure that they could deliver the very best treatment to children with cancer and it didn't matter who those children were. One can't imagine a world, can you, where if you lived in a rural area of Victoria you would get a different treatment to if you lived in Melbourne, to if you get a different treatment if you lived in the middle of Australia. In fact, all those children, it makes us quite a unique country actually, all those children get exactly the same treatment. And that means our five-year survival rates are exactly the same. There's no difference in the inequalities. And again, that took a whole lot of researchers coming together across different institutes, together with external agencies, because if we're just doing research and looking at ourselves, that's not what it's really about. So I want to bring those two examples up, because it shows to me that when you have researchers across different disciplines working together for something of great common good, together with policymakers, together with the workforce on the ground, and together with the third ingredient that we sometimes miss, which is political and moral will to do something really well, that in fact we can do extraordinary things. And I think if COVID has taught us anything, is that we can do extraordinary things. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for. Um, but uh, please join me to thank our wonderful panellists and their view of the future. I, I think we've seen some common themes of doing the best research in partnerships that really look at how we can implement it into practice. But I think most importantly, we're really changing, whether it's in genomic medicine or whether it's in how our kids develop and get the best start to life. Um, it's really about changing that focus from waiting for disease to happen and then trying to do something about it, which is expensive and ineffective, um, to really looking at prevention and early intervention uh, and keeping those kids out of our wonderful Royal Children's Hospital. Um, so thank you all so much and, and thanks for being such a, a wonderful audience. Back to you, Dan. Thank you. Please join me again in thanking our panel members and Professor North. Uh, that concludes our official proceedings for this evening. On behalf of the Governor, I now invite you to stay and enjoy the hospitality of Government House. The State Departments will be open for viewing. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.